When did you begin studying Netflix TV shows? A few years ago, um, definitely when I was uh, coming out, developing my book on TV, um, Story Maps TV Drama, the structure of the one hour television pilot, where I broke down the structure of one hour pilots from a lot of different networks and streamers and stuff. And I definitely wanted to have some Netflix shows in there. Um, and in that first book, I broke down House of Cards, which was like the seminal big, that was their first big show that they produced and distributed. Um, so that was a big benchmark for them. Um, and now, I mean, they've had hundreds of shows since then, of course, but, uh, but yeah, it's fascinating. And, and writers always ask me about that. And they're like, Netflix has a thousand shows. How can I get mine in there? You know, which is a normal question, you know, um, but it is extremely competitive. And the thing is, everybody wants to get on Netflix, even the established filmmakers and established TV people. And for a while, I don't know if they're still doing it. Netflix was overpaying the market for everybody. They were paying anyone more than other companies were giving them. It's actually kind of in their, in their company rules is if you're an employee of Netflix and you can prove that someone who does your same job at another company gets more money than you, they will raise your salary up to that level. At least that's the way they started. Reed Hastings put in that rule when they first started. Um, but content wise, I mean, they're a huge uh, studio. They're a huge factory. They do every genre imaginable. So it's an exciting place. Um, their financials are crazy. Everybody's kind of like, we don't know how they uh, fund so much stuff, billions and billions of dollars of content, but somehow they do it. And so they're a big dog, definitely. <laughs> what have you learned about the structure of Netflix TV shows? Well, they distinguish themselves from definitely the major networks, the broadcast networks, in that they target audiences and topics more succinctly. You know, they're focused more on a niche. That's kind of first off. You know, your broadcast networks like your ABC, NBC, CBS, and even a lot of your uh, basic cable channels, they're going for a broad audience. I mean, it's right in there in the title. They want basically everyone. Um, they want uh, every generation of the family to watch their show. So they're not that risky. They're not that edgy. They're not cutting edge with style and tone and filmmaking. But Netflix uh, decided they were going to be edgy and be more adult and more mature. And I mean, in some cases, just more R-rated. And they came out with House of Cards and it was more like a movie. It looked cinematic and it had nudity and bad language and violence, and it was heavily serialized. Um, so I think they came out and they wanted to distinguish themselves differently from other broadcast networks at the time. There weren't that many streamers at the time. Now there are, of course. But I think the number one thing that they do is they're targeting niches in a global audience. So they know for example, that in Brazil, uh, Brazil loves uh, cop shows or something. So they're targeting, they want to find a cop show that maybe has a, a female detective and some other element that they know is big in Brazil because they have all these analytics. So they develop that, that little niche show, they go out to creatives and say, do you have anything for this audience? And they're targeting it specifically for that audience. And they definitely want a global audience because they want to sell subscriptions to their service all over the world. So those are a few of the ways that they distinguish themselves. Um, and there are some, they don't necessarily use a different act structure, like a one hour drama on Netflix uses the basic same teaser plus four acts, teaser plus five acts that other streamers and other networks use for drama, you know, that I've broken down in my book. Um, same with half an hour, although half an hour shows now, they either call them 30 minute dramas or dramedies. They are more experimental. Some of them are only 21 minutes. Some of them are over 30 minutes. And there's really kind of no rules really with those. Um, the majority do a cold open plus three acts, but there is a lot of experimentation, which is exciting.
Is there anything different you will find with the characters of a Netflix TV show that maybe other streamers don't have, other networks don't have? I mean, I would say probably they're more edgy and dark. Um, a lot of the Netflix material is dark, even if it's entertaining and even if it's targeted at a younger audience. You know, a show like Wednesday is darker than something that's on like the CW channel, you know. A lot of their high school shows, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, or other ones that I don't even know about, um, they're more edgy, they're more mature, and maybe that's why they're successful is they're not dumbing it down for kids. They're not thinking, oh, only kids are watching this, so I'm going to make this material less complicated or serious or edgy, you know? They definitely have that thing where they're not afraid to go dark. What is one of your favorite Netflix pilots? So definitely Stranger Things. It's one of their most popular shows ever. Huge audience and they put a lot of money into it and they really market it because they know people love it all around the world. And it has a really great pilot. It has a really compelling, crazy opening where there's like a monster. And so you know, I don't, you don't see the monster, I think, but you see its effects and stuff. Um, so you know you're in this fantasy monster type of story where kind of anything goes. Then you meet these kids and you feel kind of the uh, 80s Spielbergian type of family nostalgia feeling. Um, kind of reminds you of like Goonies or E.T., you know, so they have that nostalgia element. That's the style. Um, they even show in there in the pitch deck that they used which you can find online, they have stills from a lot of like 70s and 80s movies like E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And so they were definitely going for that right off the bat. Um, but they have parallel stories. So they have the kids who are looking for their friend who disappeared. And then they have Eleven, the girl with the powers who's escaped from the laboratory. So those are parallel stories until the very end when they meet. And that's kind of the cliffhanger, like what's going to happen now that they've met, you know? And will the boys know that she has some kind of special powers? And I don't know if she, maybe she doesn't even show her special powers in the pilot. I don't quite remember. But you know that something is amazing with her. She escaped from this secret institute. Um, so it has a really good ending. Um, you also bring in adult characters, Winona Ryder. Um, and the sheriff, so you have a good uh, cast of characters, different ages, different generations, different tones to their dialogue, um, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is, for, and forgive me, I don't know that much about the show, but that uh, because there's multi-generations and it has this nostalgia element to it, is that why it's had such a broad appeal? I think, it, I think it was a big reason it broke out to begin with. And the same with Cobra Kai, which is also a Netflix show. Um, you know, people of my age remember seeing The Karate Kid when we were kids in the 80s, you know. Um, and then kids today will follow the younger kids in the show and they like all the action and kicking and fights and everything like that. Um, so yeah, I think nostalgia is a huge thing. You definitely see that a lot with shows on the air on all different networks. Um, you're also seeing now movies that are about pop culture trends like Barbie and like um, there's a movie about the Beanie Babies, you know? And so people are like, oh, I remember when I played with Barbie or G.I. Joe. I remember when I had a Beanie Baby. So that can be a huge thing even if you don't have um, ownership of an IP kind of the general uh, niche or uh, milieu that you are recalling it could still have a nostalgic element. You know, let's say you uh, are writing something about um, an 80s rock band and you're, it's not specifically about, you know, Foreigner or Def Leppard or Guns N' Roses, but you kind of, uh, you fictionalize. We know that's kind of the world that it is, right? Well, that's nostalgia. People remember hearing those songs on the radio. So that could be a good little uh, window into the world that you could bring in and nostalgia could help find an audience for that. Yeah, and I don't know if this is true for other generations, but it seems like younger people now, 
they like music from a few generations ago because the people there's the debate when was the best film and music well it was you know whatever and it's yeah. not current yeah and so some of that is like you know i don't know if that's true for other generations that they liked maybe 20 years prior mm -hmm. content but yeah i think you know i think about that a lot i'm actually writing a pilot um i have a pilot that's set in the hair metal era uh in 1991 in la and <laughs> So I think about nostalgia a lot and I think about older trends. When I was a kid, we romanticized the 60s, right? I remember my older brother even saying, oh, I, wish I, I wish I was born 10 years earlier so I could have been like a teenager in the yep. 60s. I, I the could have seen thing. The Doors and Led yeah. Zeppelin and The Who and all this stuff. And that was the music he listened to. Um, he didn't listen to that much modern music, even though there was great stuff happening at that time. But so we romanticized the 60s, my generation, now, I think they're romantic. They definitely romanticized the 80s, but now they're getting to the 90s. And it's an era that they were, they were maybe really little kids or they weren't even born yet. And so they're having their own ideas about it and they're seeing kind of uh, elevated, you know, um, examples of it in film and TV, you know, that maybe weren't quite accurate to the time, but they're being made into kind of caricatures and stuff and the music and the movies they're discovering for the first time. You know, you have a, like, call it needle drops now. So it shows like Euphoria and Stranger Things. They're actually writing about what songs they have in each episode, and some of them break out, you know. What are the keys to making audiences binge watch a Netflix series? Well, Netflix uh, from the get-go was heavily serialized. So they are not afraid to do a lot of plotting. They're not afraid to have cliffhangers, um, but they're not too reliant on big cliffhangers because they know you're just gonna go to the next episode. So it's not like you're gonna be waiting for a week, you know? Um, but they, one thing they do is they don't bother to recap the previous episode because you're binging and they know you just watched it. Um, I have seen a few shows lately on other, other streaming services like Max and Hulu and stuff, and they do, um, it not just the previously on, but they'll kind of back up the story in the next episode. They'll start with like a minute or so showing the ending of the previous episode. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Because we're binging it, you know, this is a streaming service. So that's one thing they don't worry about. Um, but I think they use, uh, they go for high concepts, you know, they get, they go for, um, ideas that are pretty crazy and edgy and they uh like i said they target areas of the world and markets you know very niche oriented targeting they use their analysis to know what audiences are interested in so maybe that's the the thing is they know if they're giving an audience something that they know they want in sri lanka or whatever they know they're gonna binge it you know I don't know, does that touch on that? Yeah, but we had Nielsen ratings, and so it's mm -hmm. interesting how somehow this seems like they they really have the, the viewer dialed in more so than the Yeah, Nielsen. they have a lot more analytics than they did back in the Nielsen days. And also, they're thinking about the whole world. You know, before it was North America, it was... Um, you know, Friends is going to attract 18 million people on a Thursday night, and the main demo is 18 to 35, you know, for example, um, and maybe more women watch it than men, maybe it's like 60-40% or something like that. But now they know, like, in Indonesia, these are the genres that they watch in this region, and this is however many minutes they watch before they tune out and go, go somewhere else. Now they know what audiences are watching in other countries down to the region, and they know the gender and the ethnicity and the age and where they live, and they have all these analytics for what topics and what genres they watch, and they know how long of the episode they watch before they stop and tune out, they know if they come back to it to finish the episode, or they know if they never come back to it, and then what do they go to next? So maybe they're just, uh, maybe they're just sampling that comedy, but they bailed out on that comedy 
two minutes in, decided they didn't like it, and they went to Extraction, the movie with Chris Hemsworth. So now they're like, oh, okay, they're more interested in action movies. And they watched all of Extraction, and then they watched Wednesday. So they just, they have so much data that it's just uh, a lot more targeted these days. Are there any don'ts when it comes to writing a series for Netflix? Uh, I would say just try to not make it feel like a broadcast series. Um, probably avoid procedurals, I would say. Procedurals are, you know, the case of the week type of shows. They're mostly on broadcast networks. There are a few on streamers like Poker Face, uh, I guess is a pretty big hit, and that's kind of a um, Columbo type of mystery thing where there's a different story every week, a different case every week. Um, but Netflix isn't really doing those, so you probably want to avoid procedurals. And it probably does need to be more edgy or dark or high concept than um, your genre audience normally would be on a broadcast network. So a cop show on ABC is probably too broad and too safe for Netflix. They want something more edgy. They want more of a cultural element maybe, a setting that we haven't seen before. So really drill down on something specific, you know, be specific. Okay, so maybe then like an informant and he's not normally part of the force, but they're gonna mm -hmm. pay him to infiltrate this world because they know that person knew that world or something, and so yeah, it shows maybe his it's life. A, yeah, maybe like Narcos uh, was a big hit for them. Um, there had probably compare like Narcos versus Miami Vice, you know. True. Okay. Um, I'm Fine. sure Narcos is a lot more intense, and there's going to be more violence and sex, and it's just going to kind of be more mature. It's going to have a bigger budget. It's going to look more cinematic um, than you know a, a cop show on ABC.